how do we actually translate that into a sustainable society that we're all aiming for? So we've got, asked uh, Mr. Ron Vins to join, join us and talk about that. So he give you a little bit of work on his background. He uh, until recently was chairman of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. So what is that? That's the state agency that controls and regulates the utilities, which as you may have heard is called Excel. He was appointed to that position by Governor Ritter, who you've heard from as well. Uh, spent several years, about four years, a little more than four years as chair of the Public Utilities Commission. Before that, he had a number of positions, including uh, heading the state's consumer advocate, which is the top person in the state who essentially protects consumers against uh, or in the presence of utilities and other um, also worked as a, uh, in Washington as president of something called the Competition Policy Institute. He just has a lot of experience in translating, understanding how technology plays out in the context of electricity systems. Uh, are you okay with that? Thank you, Paul. Sure. Do I do I have a uh, remote mouse? Or, no? Well, it's, there's nothing plugged in here. Okay, so you can get it. So I will hear okay. Uh, no, that's okay. Actually, I brought one with me. We also have a mic if you'd like. Is that working? Yes. So what can you use up here? Sure. This will be Well, I'm impressed. How many of you actually understood what that last guy was talking about? Really? You, you're not raising your hand. <laughs> um, I'm probably going to shape my remarks a little bit, uh, given what I now know about you. Namely, you could understand that last guy. Um, I have an ABD in mathematics. And so when the equations got up there, I got kind of excited, and I sort of knew what he was talking about. But uh, most of the lingo and mo most of the concepts I didn't understand. So Paul gave uh, you uh, an introduction to me. Um, I basically do energy policy in the United States. I was very active in Colorado as a regulator of utility companies. Um, that's a very long way from talking about interfaces on thin film photovoltaic system. So um, I'm going to, it occurred to me I should start out by saying a la the old uh, Monty Python and now for something completely different because this will be different. And I'm also going to do a different kind of discussion here. I'm going to have slides for a little while and then I'm going to invite you to ask me about anything you're wondering about in this whole area of energy policy, renewable policy, what I know about what's going on around this country and some other countries in the world. Now, I understand that about well, most, many of you are foreign nationals, is that right? How many are not U.S. citizens? Okay, all right, so that helps me. I would have felt we could have known that, but what the hell, Paul? What do you like to say? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have a consulting practice in energy and telecom. I um, focus on climate issues, clean tech, green tech. Uh, I've got several clients who are uh, very doing very innovative things, including Dow Solar. Uh, the Dow Chemical Company has a solar division, which is now making shingles so that you can actually put a roof on your house which has embedded thin film solar in that. They plug shingles together and you get um, a building integrated photovoltaics. I have a website, it's called, public, my enterprise is called Public Policy Consulting and I have a website, rbiz.com, if you want to see some of the things I've done. My most recent papers aren't there yet, but they will be shortly, so I'll invite you to go there. So I also am working with Governor Bill Ritter, whom you met um, in a previous lecture. He heads something called the Center for the New Energy Economy at Fort Collins at Colorado State University. And, um, uh, and he started that right after he left office. We were found, founded, uh, funded by foundations. 
And our mission is to provide policymakers, including governors, planners, and other decision makers, with a roadmap that will accelerate the nationwide deployment of the new energy economy. Now, I've got um, a takeaway I'd like to propose for my lecture. This isn't just about technology. It's about policy, vision, and governmental commitment actually to moving towards a greener economy, towards sustainable energy practices. And all of the uh, transfer mediums, all of the uh, efficient uh, whole production devices can't add up to much at all if you don't have a societal structure that's moving all this forward. And that's what I tend to work on. Here's another takeaway. Ger any Germans in here? I thought I heard a German accent back there. Germany has the insulation that is the solar resource of Alaska. You all know where Alaska is. Don't get a lot of sun in Alaska. Which part of Germany are you from? Near Berlin, okay. I was just in Berlin two weeks ago and um, stayed in uh, Friedrichstrasse, if you know where that is. And um, besides this fact, that's kind of an interesting fact all by itself, in May of this year, 10% of all German electricity is produced by solar energy. That's kilowatt hours. <coughs> Annually, the number's about 5% overall. Is that a big number? Well, it's a small number in some sense. The US is 0.04%. So, so, do a real quick ratio, I think, Germany, in relative terms, has 125 times the amount of solar that the U.S. has. Other countries fit in different places. The U.S. is no slouch. We're moving along, we think. What's the difference? It's certainly not insulation level. If anything, that works against it. In fact, the insulation level in Germany is about half what most of the continental U.S. is. The reason is policy drivers led mostly by government. Here's another takeaway. The United States is the only country in the world to seriously debate still the causes and effect of climate change. Ritter told me, no Ritter told me that the other day. Only government in the world is doing it. Now, you're not US citizens, and so maybe you don't feel ashamed of it like I do. Um, <laughs> but this is a, a again, indicator that in order to make things happen in this space, you've got to have um, the forces aligned, and we don't in this country. I'm going to skip a couple slides here. It's really background about what Ritter and I do. Um, I'm going to actually skip a few slides here. Okay. Here's another example of sort of the intervention of policy, energy policy, in, a, in an economy. You'll see the kink in the curve there in 2007. That's when Bill Ritter got elected governor. Look what happened to the percentage of new houses in the U.S. which are energy star rated in Colorado. Um, that was because, not anything in the economy per se, it was because the governor and his energy office decided we were going to go in a different direction. This is sort of another bit of evidence of what I'm talking about. Um, don't worry about these. I'm going to talk about some policies. You saw that whole list of acronyms I put up at the front end. It actually is iambic pentameter. It tends to have a nice rhythm if you say it. And a little internal rhymes as well. All those acronyms I put in there, um, you I guess we've passed that slide now. I put all those acronyms in there to basically show you uh, some of the things that need to be thought about. Uh, and you know, RPS was one of them. That's what the United States uses to advance renewable energy policy, renewable portfolio standard. In Europe and in uh, Japan and elsewhere, there are, as you probably know, feed-in tariffs that are used to uh, 
uh, compensate generators of renewable energy for the cost of their production. We've decided to use an RPS. In Colorado, the voters of Colorado decided in 2004 that we wanted a 10% RPS, 10% by 2020, meaning 10% of all energy, you know, kilowatt hours, uh, had to be renewable by 2020. Three years later, the legislature increased that to 20%. Uh, that was the f one of the first bills that Ritter signed as governor in 2007. And three years after that, Colorado increased the RPS to 30%. And that's the policy tool we use here. It basically tells the utility companies, um, at least the ones that are regulated, it tells them that they must make plans to incorporate that percentage of um, renewable defined in the statute, renewable energy in their um, portfolios. Colorado also in 2010, importantly, carved out 3% of the entire amount, not 3% of the 30, but 3% of the total, to be distributed generation. So small systems, rooftop solar, small wind projects, things like that. Yes, ma'am. The punishment for the energy companies who don't do this, uh, we have never had to test that because they are all on track. Well, it's not 2020 yet. Say again? It's not 2020 yet. I know, but they're on a trajectory which indicates they will be there. In fact, they're ahead of schedule. They're ahead of schedule. They're ahead of schedule in the 30%. In fact, one photon out of seven in this room is being produced by renewable energy in Colorado. We're at about 15% towards the 30, and that's only since uh, 2007 is really when this started. <clears throat> Excuse me, 2004, but it didn't really kick in until about 2007. Excel Energy, the utility that serves Boulder right now, Boulder's trying to figure out if it wants to stay married to Excel Energy. You probably all know this little controversy, but. Um, Excel Energy has been a, a very uh, progressive utility with respect to renewable, um, renewable energy policies. In Colorado, it's mainly wind. By the way, I didn't talk about wind in Germany. More German kudos here. Uh, Germany has about the same amount of wind nationally as the U.S. has. But Germany also has one-fourth of the U.S. population. So on a per capita basis, they're about 4x on the U.S. with respect to wind power. So the legislature uh, increased this portfolio standards I mentioned. They also passed something in 2010 which is very relevant and it's a, a national precedent called the Clean Air Clean Jobs Act. I'm going to come back to that and talk about what we did under that. In all, and I'm sure uh, Ritter told you this, during his four years there were 79 pieces of legislation having to do with energy policy in the state. Now, is 79 a big number over four years? Well, you would probably find in many states the number is probably 10 or something like that. So Colorado was a very active form for this. There's your list. <laughs> Hope you can read them all. Then. I was the chairman of the Public Utilities Commission. What did we do? Well, we implemented the RPS had to adopt rules and policies, just like the woman was asking about. Um, we were strapped with a requirement that rates could not go up more than 2%, more than they would have increased but for the renewable portfolio standard. So we didn't claim that rates were going to go up only 2%, but that would have been the delta over what the trajectory would have been. We implemented an energy efficiency renewal standard, excuse me, a resource standard. Um, that's your uh, familiar programs of demand side management where the utility actually goes out and pays people to conserve um, electricity or use it more wisely. Um, skip. We rewrote the rules in Colorado for transmission. And again, you don't care about these things in any particular direct sense, except if you want 
the industry in which you're planning to go to succeed, somebody has to do this part of it. I want to talk about the Clean Air, Clean Jobs Act in just a minute. Actually, let's do it right now. <clears throat> this is a law passed in Colorado. It was the first of its type in the country. In fact, it's still the only one of its type in the country. I think you probably know that utilities are regulated as cost of service entities. They get, they get to collect in rates what they spent recently and um, change prices to do this. Well, that doesn't get you very doesn't get you a very comprehensive look at everything that's going on. It's well known in the U.S. that the Environmental Protection Agency is promulgating a series of rules to clean up air pollution of various kinds, mercury emissions, and eventually carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions. If you take those serially, one at a time, you may make mistakes in your resource choices early on, that you'll have to correct later. So it's far from optimal. The Colorado legislature said, we want a comprehensive look at this. Uh, we want the utility to consult with the air regulator on a plan that will meet current and projected air rules for the utility. Well, that sounds smart, but it's also rare that anybody in a utility or a regulatory agency would be asked to look and guess what the future is going to hold. Again, it sounds completely reasonable, but it's, it is unusual. The utility filed that plan with the Public Utilities Commission, and the minimum that they had to deal with was 900 megawatts. They ended up dealing with 1,800 megawatts, so two gigawatts of, tr of power in Colorado. Uh, the utility is required to do various studies to find out what the impact on this changeover and their plan would be on uh, NOx, uh, uh, oxides of nitrogen, on the cost of controlling emissions in existing power coal plants, and on the cost of changing over the generation to natural gas, which on a greenhouse gas basis I think you know is half as intense, generally speaking, as generating coal. Um, the air regulator participated in our process, and we were strapped, the commission was strapped with the requirement that any plan we approved must meet projected EPA rules. Uh, it was quite a proceeding. We had uh, about 20 plans filed with us, taking different power plants, doing various things to them, controlling some of them, closing some of them, converting some on a fuel basis from coal to natural gas, for example. Um, very large natural gas interests and coal interests uh, intervened in the cases. Uh, the largest coal company in the country, and it's probably one of the largest in the world, Peabody Coal, uh, intervened in our case. They were not interested in seeing less coal burn. The natural gas providers had the exact opposite interest. They wanted to see more natural gas. We had very large public hearings. I got to chair hearings of 350 coal miners in one instance and explain to them why it was good that we might close the coal plants. You can sort of imagine the reaction we got to that. Um, one gentleman, um, this is dead serious, said to me, Mr. Chairman, I know this is clean coal because we wash it before we sell it. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the level of understanding in some places about what this is all about. 91 expert witnesses testified before my commission. Uh, you won't. You don't need to know all these things, but there was a lot of litigation. Um, eventually, um, I was moved, as was my uh, colleague on the commission, we were moved by one of the parties, the coal interest, to be disqualified. And we had to leave the commission and could not hear the case. That went on to district court, it was appealed. In fact, I just won this the other day. I was in Portland recently. I picked up a feed from Denver, and I found out that on the appeals court, I won. So I 
Even though I stepped down from the commission, they're still litigating this. Uh, we had hearings in the evenings and on Saturday. So I don't know how many times you've had classes that go Saturdays. We were almost in the evening today. But that's pretty irregular. Uh, what we did eventually, just to show you again the slow march of this, is we took four units of the Cherokee plant, see the circle on the map, that's in North Denver. We retired three of those units and converted one of them to natural gas. We took two uh, Arapaho units, uh, 150 megawatts more or less, in southeast Denver, southwest Denver, excuse me, retired one of them, turned one of them into a synchronizing condenser. So it was a uh, VAR support on the now popular language, right? You all know what VARs are? You know? You don't know about power electronics at all? No, no, no. I was going to impress you with that. Well, actually, I will impress you. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay? Anyway, we converted those to synchronizing condensers so the system would continue to run. Uh, Valmont 5, which is in east of Boulder, a uh, long time a sore point for the citizens of Boulder, a coal plant sitting outside of Boulder, Colorado. That's going to be closed down. Uh, we controlled two other units uh, with uh, selective catalytic uh, uh, emission reduction devices uh, and another large unit. So you see all those circles in the maps. Uh, a grand total of, I think, 11 units we dealt with in one big case to move Colorado significantly away from coal production towards um, natural gas for the most part, but also we uh, made more room for wind at the same time. This is Colorado. Um, the square up there shows the most energy intensive, or in, in solar intensive part of the state. It's called the San Luis Valley. Um, it's considered to be some of the most uh, valuable solar um, resources in the United States. You can see the rest of the country, uh, the rest of the Southwest, California, and Arizona, and New Mexico. But it turns out that the San Luis Valley is a high elevation, flat, um, and very uh, suitable climate-wise for solar. Uh, we're going to come back to that one in a minute. I'll show you more about that. Actually, let's go ahead and do that and we'll come back. Oops. We have a problem here. Well, we'll see if those slides. I have, I have an animation here that's not seem to be working. When you're talking about um, renewable resources or clean energy resources or resources at all, you need to consider the cost of the technologies. And these are the best guesses for what energy efficiency, natural gas combined cycle, offshore wind, geothermal, biomass, large solar PV, large central station PV, and so forth, all the way up to nuclear and coal with what's called um, CCS, that's uh, carbon capture and sequestration or storage. These are all low carbon, lower carbon resources, similar to zero, of course. This is dollars per megawatt hour, and this is the current set of estimates done by the Union of Concerned Scientists about what the costs of these are. Now, for each resource, there's actually two numbers, two ranges, as so let's just take, for example, biomass. This kind of gray green bar in each one of these is the cost without incentives, without government programs supporting or keeping the price down or rewarding the investors. Uh, the bar above the gray bar in each case includes the incentives. So you can see how U.S. policy lays out in this regard. The color bars here show what the uh, additional cost of uh, CO2 mitigation will be and as we assume the Environmental Protection Agency or uh, public policy in this country will deal with greenhouse gases. So you can see a spectrum. 
Um, it's, I think, most notable on this that um, uh, solar, while it's kind of in the middle of the pack here, uh, it's expensive today, it is in the middle of the pack. Um, and all of these lower um, cost resources, generally speaking, are renewable. Uh, natural gas is in there, it's not renewable, of course, but, um, it, it, and I guess the loudest noise of all here is from energy efficiency. Making the use of energy more efficient is by far the cheapest thing you can do. Now, I just wrote a paper, and I've got copies of it, and I'm also leaving behind um, the electronic version of this, that rank those same resources that you just saw in that chart with respect to cost. This is really just a ranking of the one you just saw. And then we did another analysis that talked about the risk of the resources. Our advocacy in this paper is that you need to not only look at the cost, but also the risk. And the risk lands in a bunch of different categories, but a composite risk shows that efficiency is also the least risky investment you can make. Large solar has fallen from the sort of the mid ranks down to uh, the bottom quartile in terms of risk. Um, and again, collected down this bottom really are the emissions free or clean energy resources. Uh, at the top, the riskier uh, ventures, um, and I, I've now got a two dimensional curve that puts both cost and risk on this. So if you're a uh, policymaker, your interest is in working out of this uh, uh, southeast corner of the uh, map here, or excuse me, southwest corner of this map, looking for resources which are simultaneously. Um, reasonable cost, that's this axis, but also reasonable risk. Yes? What kind of risks were assessed in that? Um, you can read the paper to get the full flavor of it. The kinds of risks we looked at are overnight cost risks, capital risks. Nuclear has an incredibly bad record of uh, turning out to be a lot more expensive than you estimated at the beginning. There's really no, I mean, and we don't seem to have learned that lesson. That was true in the 70s and the 80s. But there's a plan in, in Florida right now, which was supposed to be $6 billion. The current estimate is $24 billion. It was supposed to come online in 2016. The current estimate is 2027. Okay, So that, that's one example of risk. Another example of risk is um, fuel price risk. Uh, there's a lot of interest right now in investing in natural gas generation and in uh, some of these uh, coal um, technologies. But the pr future price of those is uh, somewhat, um, not somewhat, is significantly exposed to risk. On the other hand, a wind turbine, you don't expect the price cost of wind to change anytime soon. So, so it's mostly economical risks, not risks like the nuclear power plant. Economical risks and not risks like dangerous, like the um, power plant blowing up. No, well, I mean, that that actually that yes, we do capture that in the sense of all of the rules that surround technologies. And again, I'll use nuclear. I mean, part of the cost of nuclear is because of the fact that you've got all of these requirements on. That said, there's also subsidies to nuclear because a lot of those costs have been capped by government policy. But, but the, it's the risk that something will be different than you expect it to. That's what it comes down to. A risk of the capital risk to the utility corporations who are financing it, for example, is one. Um, and I think we, we identified seven categories of risk. I'm going to, uh, again, show you later that paper and uh, commit it to your reading. I'm also running an organization or project called Utilities 2020. Again, I know this is special in the United States, but I also know, um, anybody here from Great Britain, from the UK? No? Nope. Uh, we've covered Germany, let's see where else. Anybody from the Kingdom of Jordan? Nope. Okay, can't help you. Um, I'm doing work in India. There we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. India. 
Um, I'm very interested in the way in which regulation is undertaken. We are of the opinion, we meaning myself and a colleague, are of the opinion that regulation isn't serving the clean energy revolution particularly well because we don't really reward the utilities for what we want them to do. We compensate them on the basis of old formulas having to do with their costs, backward looking with very little incentive to them to perform in the way we want them to with respect to energy policy. Uh, that's a project I'm running. And, um, we capture what this is about and what's called the evolving utility business model. Utilities are under multiple threats to their business as usual. Um, their air techno technology risks. Uh, I'm going to go with Germany again. Uh, the cost of electricity in Germany is more or less twice what it is in the United States on average. It's relatively higher priced. The cost of solar, we told you that the insulation level is pretty poor in Germany, but somehow those Germans have figured out how to install solar at about half the cost in the United States. So uh, per watt basis in Germany of a ground mount solar system is $2.24 a watt, US dollars per watt. In the United States, it's $4.44 per watt. So, what's going on in Germany? It turns out that the feed-in tariff, the payment to Germans for producing solar electricity, is now less than the cost of electricity. They have reached grid parity in Germany. Now, they've done it in part by having high electricity costs, but they've also done it because they brought down the cost of solar so sharply in Germany. So Germans in the Bayern, particularly in the south of Germany, uh, are putting solar on everything. And then, uh, you, I'm not say everything, I mean outbuildings and uh, barns and everything else. You can probably testify to this. If you go there, you can't look in any direction without seeing a solar installation on the roof. Um, but the... Uh, Threats to business as usual, and that's an example. The distributed generation will be a threat. Um, you've got other entities. The smart grid itself is a threat with the um, intervention of technology and the customer relationship with utility. Um, it's my view that if we want utilities to survive, much less grow, we've got to make substantial change, changes to the regulation. And as I said earlier, there's really a misalignment between regulatory incentives and the behavior we expect uh, utilities to undertake. This is true all over the world. The United Kingdom has been making great strides in changing their regulatory regime. And I mentioned um, India. They're also looking at that very same question in India. And we also do not particularly reward companies for their efficiency as firms. Regulation tends to compensate them for their reporting costs, but since there aren't competitors to the utilities, they don't really have much of a pressure, much of an inducement of the kind that competitive markets have actually to become efficient as firms are. And in the United States at least, um, I'm working with others to uh, propose and, and try to move forward on a new compact, a new way, I call it a grand bargain, for how we actually make policy um, induce utilities um, or command them, but induce them as preferred, uh, to start taking up the technologies that we want them to take up, pricing their products the way we want them to do that. Um, I told you I'd like to have a discussion, and for whatever time is left, uh, I'm willing to talk about anything you want, except possibly uh, those little uh, equations that I saw in the last background. I'm really impressed that you understood what he's talking about. I, I'm really impressed. So look forward to questions. You better talk about questions for Ron?
You're absolutely right, and um, in this uh, state, and to some extent in this country, we've woken up to the notion that we are profligate wasters of energy. We just use it inefficiently. And um, uh, I'm going to tell you a couple stories here. One is that um, in my house, personally, I just replaced 26 65-watt halogen lamps with LEDs, cost me 20 bucks a bulb. My break-even point is about four and a half years. Okay? I just cut my lighting electricity by 88% by doing that. I went from 65 watt bulbs to more or less six watt bulbs, something like that. Um, I did that because I was the chairman of the Public Utilities Commission and I understood all this. Okay? The great masses do not understand that yet. Some of them don't even settle for a four and a half year break point. I mean, I think that's a, actually a very good investment. If you can get your money back, if you earn your money back in four and a half years, that's an internal rate of return of 15% or something like that. A very smart investment. But there's so many barriers to that happening naturally in this country. We've understood we have to have programs that move people there. And that's the stage we're at right now. So um, you asked me what was Colorado doing. Colorado went from um, a uh, policy in, in 2007, 2006, kind of along the lines of what Dick Cheney used to think of energy efficiency. It's a good personal virtue. It's a quote from Dick Cheney. We said, not only is it a good personal virtue, it's a good way to run a utility company. It's a good way to create, um, essentially, it's called megawatts, negative watts, um, by efficiency. So we began systematically to pump a lot of money into programs which do that very thing. Now, that can't be the eventual long-term answer. Somehow, customers in our country are going to have to understand that there is more than just personal virtue. There is actually economics in doing that. I'm going to tell you about the second story in addition to what we're doing in Colorado. Is one of my um, engagements is as an advisor to a company. It's called American Efficient. It's a small startup in California. And what they have done is they've created this uh, data engine which they then sell to retailers and various other providers of, of efficient appliances that predicts who's going to buy something. Okay? They have this, they've tapped into this database of the age of appliances all over the country. They've tapped into the point of sale systems of the large big box stores that sell all this. And so what it comes down to is they will have a system in place, they're doing it now in some parts of the country, in which you go to a Best Buy, big provider of refrigerators or something like that, and your cell phone will chirp and say, you know, if you buy this refrigerator, you get $100 back at the cash register because your utility company wants you to conserve electricity. So it makes it seamless. That's 
for a norm. It's going to take something like that. I was just in Berlin, I mentioned, and um, the average, now, the average floor space of a German house is smaller than the U.S., but that's not the only explanation. Electricity use per capita in Germany is about half what it is in the United States. Um, here, it's un not unusual to have uh, average customer using 700, 800, 900 kilowatt hours per month. In Germany, it's about 300 much more commonly seen as 300. Where are you from? Nepal. Nepal? Say again? I think our house has five of this. Five kilowatt hours? No, unlikely. Five kilowatts. It's not that high. No, no, no. But again, average here is probably seven, eight hundred. Um, it's lighting, it's refrigeration, it's plasma televisions, it's uh, PCs in the house, it's stereo systems, on and on and on. It's not heating, it's not, we don't use electricity for heating in this country. So um, that's generally recognized. Energy efficiency is generally recognized as the least, I showed you my graph, the least cost, and states are moving towards that. Let me wrap this up. In Colorado, There's no federal deadline of anything like that. There's state by state ones. Colorado is getting close to net zero growth in electricity demand, and many other states are as well. The, the energy efficiency measures that have been undertaken, and by the way, the most productive place to do it is in commercial enterprises, in Walmart stores in small shops. It tends to be lighting and motors and things like that where the most efficiencies can be made. Um, I would like to say that the U.S. is doing a lot. I don't think we're doing a lot. I think we're doing some. And um, again, I know you didn't ask this, but one of the upcoming events in this country is going to be with an environmental protection agency begins to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants. That's not happening yet. They've issued a rule for new plants. They're going to go back and do this for existing plants. Um, I'm actually working with an organization which is attempting to come up with a regime where compliance can be made in part by energy efficiency. So I think it's going to give a good boost. I gave a talk yesterday night for the same group I'm from the Netherlands. Yes. And uh, my uh, my standard riddle is that you know either the Germans are totally crazy or something is really wrong in the Netherlands because I have to admit that the Netherlands is probably just as bad as the U.S. when it comes to uh, implementation of PV. Not when it comes to the uh, of, of cost. You're saying of the cost of PV. No. no. I'm uh, active in oh, How much? I am living 30 kilometers from Germany and the difference couldn't be big. It's absolutely amazing. So yesterday I was also um, uh, pointing a little bit to what I believe could be the cause. Of why is it so different between the Netherlands and Germany? And I'm not going to give you my answer. I am very curious on your answer. Why is the difference in your view so big between the United States what is it? What cost this? Two or three things. Um, first of all, the Germans use a very transparent feed-in tariff. I don't know if the Netherlands uses a feed-in tariff or not. I would like to go one step before that, because to, to do the Oh, that's a, that's a very different... You're asking me... You're asking me questions about sort of the political economy well, of each of the countries. And, and I'm, just, I'm just thinking, well, what is your idea? What makes this difference? Well, one, I'll, I'll, again, I had discussions with a member of the Bundestag about this. And um, the United States has, in many ways, been fundamentally anti intellectual since its founding. It's a, no, it's a it's a strain in our culture, as well understood. 
how else could we debate the science of climate change as if it were a proposition worthy of debate? You don't. If you cannot teach evolution, then evolution is another example. But 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 so I think there's there's, there's something in that, that that's got something to do with it. And in that in uh, Germany, I was asking uh, this uh, member uh, about. Angela Merkel is cutting back on the subsidy for solar. She's bringing it down as the cost of solar is going down. And um, over here it's been reported that Germany is you know, changing course. That, that's how it's reported here. That Germany is backing out of its commitment to solar. That's not true, but that's the story here. And so I said to the member, I said, uh, it's seen elsewhere as a change of course. And he said, there's not a politician in this country who would oppose the solar program. None. Not the far right, not the far left. You would get in trouble. I can't hear you. You would get in a lot of trouble, I guess. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's a species of religion or not. I, I don't know. <laughs> because the Germans have, in fact, in my view, probably paid more than they should have for what they've gotten. But that's a different question. You go to the buyer and you see all these these farms, uh, the roofs of these farms coated wall to wall with salt. That's not because these are particularly green people. This is just there was a lot of money to be had, right? Okay, and that's a perfectly good way of doing it. The question is, did they go faster than they needed to, or did they go the right speed? I, I, I can't. I'm not going to be the judge of that. I'm convinced that we have not got a consensus in this country as fundamental as uh, climate change, and that is holding back a lot of other policies. Now, in terms of the cost, uh, the Germans have done a lot of good work there. The cost of solar, as I said, is about half of, for a similar, similarly situated installation, it's about half here. Um, it's balance of system costs. It's not panels. Panels are a worldwide market. There's no difference there. Um, it's permitting. It's inspections. It's basically governmental functions. Um, and it's the lack of uniformity in um, the product. They have a much more uniform approach to it. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, there are three scenarios I would like to know the current policies of the United States or even these states, which uh, the current policy, which one of these uh, is favor of which one of these policies? Okay. The policy A is that there is a company it wants to invest on solar energy. So it goes and buys a large field and installs a, a large solar farm and sells the produce electricity to the grid. This is the scenario A. The scenario B is that every individual who has a house goes and buys uh, these solar panels and put them on the roof and works with that. And the scenario C is that there is another company uh, that instead of uh, producing or installing these large farms, goes and asks people to let, to let the company install the solar on the roof or kind of leasing their solar. So th these three scenarios, I would like to know what, car, uh, what uh, the current policy support which of them. Okay, did many of you hear his question? Did you hear it? Okay, good, good. In Colorado last year, there were a lot, I can't give you the absolute number, but there were a lot of rooftop solar installations. Two thirds of them, more than 70%, were from third-party providers to the rooftop, the leasing arrangement you talked about. Okay? There are several companies in this country, Sunrun, Solar City, Sungevity, and I can't remember the fourth one, who are doing, that's their business model. Now, uh, why are they, what does the policy, what, 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 caused, what policy caused that? That's your question, really. In the case of leasing versus customers owning and putting their own solar on the roof, it's the upfront capital cost. These, these companies, these leasing companies, are effectively financial institutions. 
they maintain ownership and they and they sub out the maintenance of these panels. So they really they do own and operate the panels, but mainly what they have learned how to do is to arrange financing, arrange the tax credits that are available to both owners and leasing, but they optimize that. And so what customers now in the United States are able to do is to get a solar on the roof for basically zero dollars up front. Now, why does, I'll come back to the other third company. Now this is Colorado, but this is also true in California, in Maryland, in New Jersey, and a lot of uh, Texas, and a lot of other big solar states. Um, why, um, why is, so, so the question is, why is the individual unwilling as a general matter to come up with the money? Well, what has happened in the United States is we have gone from a system of an upfront subsidy to payment over time for performance of the solar systems. Okay? And individuals, like it or not, correct or not, have a high internal discount rate. So they prize something now as opposed to in the future. They discount future. So um, they do not see as a general matter the value of in investing in this now if it's paid out over time. That's what we were just talking about a few minutes ago with respect to that. Now, no, everything, everything solar in this country, in the world for that matter, requires a subsidy from somewhere at this point. It's just out of the money. It's out of the market. With nobody pricing carbon, with nobody pricing other externalities of electricity generation, the higher cost of solar simply can't. So, we, we, we must agree to begin with that at this point in the solar cost curve, some amount of, uh, of governmental support is necessary. Um, how that's structured who gets what drives this large this question you ask about large systems versus small systems, and with respect to small systems, it's the structure of the subsidy versus the third party. So we've got all kinds. In Germany, again, I'm not saying this was the right way to have done it. They had a feed-in tariff which said anybody can sell us electricity at these prices. Just show up and you get this. And that was deemed so transparent, so predictable, that banks were loaning money easily to the farmers of Munich. And that's what happened. They eliminated any uh, uncertainty around the financing side of this, brought down the financing costs, made the availability of lending uh, much smoother, and that's why they had the explosion. It, it, it actually, there's there is no single reason why Germany did what it did. There's a whole bunch of them. But I was just there on a trip, a, a fact-finding mission with the Solar Electricity Power Association of the United States, SEPA. And this fact-finding mission was to figure out what had Germany done actually to trigger such an explosion of solar. Now, it's also the case that the euro cent that you pay for uh, the euro dollar, euro that you pay for an amount of electricity, about 15% of that is a subsidy for solar. So they've gone... And wind and hydro. And wind and hydro. Yeah, it's 3.59 euro cents at the moment per kilowatt hour subsidy for all of those. Now, wind tends not to need much of a subsidy at all. But... But the lady's right. It's all of those things. Now, 3.59 euro cents on about a 25 euro base is somewhere in the 15% range now of what the subsidy is as a unit paid by customers. That would not be politically acceptable here. It just would not be. Would it be in the Netherlands? That's an upper bound. No. No government, yes. <laughs> Do we have more questions in the back? One more question from Ron. We're running out of time? Yes, it's almost 5 30. Maybe one more question. Um, I remember hearing this a while ago, which is correct if I'm wrong, but I remember hearing that California somehow set up a policy towards efficiency such that PG&E electrical company gained more money by 
It actually, uh, we do that here in Colorado too. The statute says that the regulator shall make the business of energy efficiency the most profitable aspect of the utilities business. And that freed up lots of utility capital to do that. In California, there's a, they have a very complex regulatory system. They have what's called decoupling, which you may have heard of. And that means that your revenues are not linked to how much you sell. So you get, you get a predictable revenue target no matter what you do. So that, that keeps you, that, that removes the inducement to sell more. That's the first step. Then they have, after that, neutralization. They have a bonus program that says you get extra profitability if you do those things. We did something similar in Colorado. We didn't do the first part, but we did the second part. In Colorado, we're pushing about 1.25% a year savings on energy efficiency. Um, that's pretty good. Arizona is shooting for 2% per year. Uh, a lot of other states are in the uh, 1% to 2% per year. Now, that's to be compared with a growth rate in demand for electricity of about the same number. So this will basically flatten out, zero out. And we're beginning to see Wall Street analysts take note of this. All of a sudden, utilities are not expected to see low growth net over a long period of time. Um, I'm going to uh, also, I think I said, this is the last thing I'm going to say, um, this has to do with that risk analysis that I was talking about. Uh, I brought about 10 paper copies. It's also electronically, I've given it to the program. And there's a couple other articles that I wrote on different things. I think it'll give you a taste for some of the policy things. Congratulations to all of you for getting into this program. I imagine you, you probably had to pay, but um, <laughs> didn't have to pay. Okay. So you, you had to be smart or something. You're good looking or something. But congratulations to all of you, and thanks for having me as your guest. Ron, I will keep you.